So when it's unmuted, when it's unmuted, hey. when it's on, it's in there. I'm going to check it out, though. That's really shocking. Because you shouldn't have been able to hear nothing. But I'll still be able to hear in ears or no? You'll be able to hear it. So when and we're muted, playing with the track. Okay.
Amen, amen. Welcome to Legacy. Hey, everybody. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us today. Be sure to comment below where you're from. And if this is your first time, let's forget about this video in Jesus' name. Also, don't worship alone. Invite your friends and family and start a watch party online or at home. Also, can't forget about kids. Legacy Kids, you can find that at legacyrainbow.com. Today is going to be life-changing. And don't just sit and watch. Get up, move that coffee table out of the way. God's presence isn't limited to a church building or any building by that means. God's spirit is right where you are. And on behalf of Pastor Les and Pastor Nikki, we love you and we're praying for you. And we're believing for the miraculous. Let's worship together. Save me. 
God is real. There goes. There goes. I am a miracle. My heart has been healed. Come and witness for yourself. He is revealed. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. opportunity to praise your name, Lord God, to come before you right now, Father God, and declare that you are real, that you're more real than anything that we could ever think of, Father God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name.
that sink in you're everything I need yeah. so we cry Abba Let me say you're my real, you're my real thing. The ground I'm standing on is what I've come to learn. My relationship with you, Father, you're my real thing. The wind in my love. Standing on the ground, I'm standing on, and it is a firm foundation. You are a firm foundation. You're more real than the air in my lungs, the wind in my lungs. Your breath, in my lungs. Your thoughts define. Your thoughts define me. You're inside of me. You're inside me.
I belong to you. I give you all that I am. I'm yours, I'm yours. Oh, Father, I belong, I belong to you. Say, Abba, I'm yours. I belong to you, Jesus. Abba. You know, sometimes, I don't know about you guys, but I lost my parents a few years ago. And I struggled with a thought that I know was not my own, but it also wasn't from the Lord. But then God spoke to me and he told me straightforward. He said, you're not an orphan. And I don't know, but I have this sense that there are some of you out there that may not have even, whether you lost your father, or you didn't have a good upbringing with a father, or your father may have been a great worker and provide for your family, but he just wasn't there for you. But to get the understanding of what Abba, Father, is, that we can come up to him, that we don't have to go through a priest or somebody in between us, that we can actually crawl up to, into his lap. And that he has such an understanding for what we're going through that he feels, that he feels our pain, he feels our hurt, and that he's there for us. And we are not orphans, but he is our father. And I want to know a father like that, that his care is for what I care for. That he just wants to hold me when I need to cry sometimes. But then he's okay with telling me, okay, it's time to get up now. It's time for you to step in your place. And it's time for you to step out. Because I have others that are hurting too. And they need your support. Yeah. So this morning, as we sing this one last time, I just want to put him in his place. I want to lift him up. And I want to call him holy. And I want to call him father. And I want to understand what father means, what Abba, this, this name for God is. Yeah. That he's everything that you need in that moment. So let's sing that again, Abba. Abba. stay right there. Father, we welcome you in this room this morning. Come on, if you would, just lift up your hands to the Lord. You may not be used to that. It's just a sign of surrender to the Lord today. Father, we surrender all that we are. We give you everything that is within us, God. Lord, we hold nothing back from you today. You are Abba, Father. You are the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God, you are everything to us. 
And Lord, we may not understand all that is going on in our lives. We may not fully realize and understand the things that we're facing today. We may be in some confusion, but God, we know that you're our Father. We know that you're a good, 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 good Father. We know that you love us, that you care for us, that you are there for us. And today we surrender everything that we have to you. Lord, it's not much, but it's all that we've got. We give you our heart today. We lay down all the striving, all the effort, all the work, all the attempts to try to earn your favor and your blessing. We lay it down and we pick up the free gift that is your love. We thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. How many know he's a holy God? Come on, how many know he's a holy God? Amen, amen. You see, God responds when we tell him how holy he is. The Bible teaches us that in heaven, the angels say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Something happens when we tell God how holy he is and how righteous he is. And this morning in pre-service prayer, before you all got here, we were praying and the Lord spoke that God wants to bring healing today. That sounds like kind of a generic thing to say, doesn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, it's church. The Lord wants to bring healing. But no, I saw in my spirit, there's some open wounds. There's some pain, some some wounds. Some people came in here hurting. Y'all, we're all wounded. We've all got stuff, we've all got pain, we've all got things that people have done to us and that life, life is tough. If you didn't know life was tough, you knew it in 2020. Can I get an amen? Amen. Life can be hard, but we serve a good God. We serve a God who can heal, who can deliver, who can cleanse, who can set free, not in a month, not in a year, not in a decade, but in an instant. He can heal. And right now, today, Jesus wants to heal some hearts. He wants to mend some wounds in this room this morning. He wants to mend some wounds for those of you that are watching online today. Wherever you are, if you're online, if you're in the room, I just want you to close your eyes. Nobody looking around. Nobody checking to see who's on their right or who's on their left. Just close your eyes. Just open up your hearts and receive healing today. Father, I thank you that you're a good God. I thank you that you're a healing Father. I thank you that the power of the Holy Spirit can cleanse and heal and deliver and set free. I thank you, God, that you are mending marriages this morning that you're putting couples back together. I thank you that you're mending families today. I thank you that you're turning the hearts of sons back to their fathers and the hearts of daughters to their mothers and you're mending families today. I thank you that you're breaking addictions today, addictions to pornography, addictions to drugs and alcohol. I thank you that you're setting people free from depression, from sickness, from disease, from anxiety, from fear. I thank you that the power of the Holy Spirit knows no bounds. There's nothing too difficult for God. There's nothing too hard. There's no place that you've been that is too far that he can't reach you. I don't care what you did last night. I don't care what you did last week. I don't care what is in your heart to do when church is over today. Jesus can reach you right where you are. He can heal and deliver and set free. He doesn't want anything from you. He doesn't need anything from you but your willingness to receive what he is freely given. Father, we worship you, Jesus. You are worthy.
healing down in this place. Rain healing down in this place, Jesus. Come on, just sing out, just sing out. Oh, rain healing down in this place. Rain healing down in this place, Jesus. somebody just receive it this morning say rain healing down rain healing down in this place I need you more I need you more I need you more rain healing down in this place rain healing down in this place Father, we need your healing, Lord. Rain healing down in this place. Rain healing down in this place. Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the healing that only you can bring. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap today. Come on, like we mean it, somebody clap before the Lord this morning. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, worship team. Thank you for leading us into your presence. We want to welcome you today to Legacy Church. If you're here in the room, if you're watching with us online, welcome. It is so glad to have you here. Don't stop playing for me. Don't stop playing. Leaving me hanging. Welcome. You, you may be seated today. Turn around and give your neighbor an air five. Don't you dare touch them. Don't you dare touch them. Give them an air five, somebody. There we go. Welcome to Legacy Church today. We got a quick video we're going to roll into, and then we'll, we'll begin the message. Well, it's good to see everybody this morning. I, th I thought the video was over. It came back up. Don't you love it when that happens? It's good to see everybody this morning. How's everybody doing today? All right. Praise the Lord. It's good to be back in the house. Nikki and I have been gone for two weeks. I, I posted something on my personal page this week. This is the first time in 20 years of ministry that I've taken off two Sundays in a row. So thank you all for allowing us to do that and for filling in and the team and I've heard great things from Walt and Brill and the words that they brought the last two weeks let's give them a hand I heard it was awesome so thank you guys for not just holding the fort down but for continuing to advance the kingdom I've heard great stuff if you don't know my name is Les Cody I'm the pastor here at Legacy Waco my wife who stepped out of the room Nikki was one of the worship leaders today, and we want to welcome you. We're so glad that you've joined us here today. Uh, for those of you that are online, most of our people are still watching us online. We love you. We're praying for you. We are here for you. If you need anything at all, you know how to reach us. Send us a direct message on Instagram or Facebook. And as always, you can text the word CONNECT to 254-218-3100. This number which will come up on the screen shortly. 254-218-3100 is like the all-encompassing number for legacy. So learn that, put it in your phone, 
Um, if, you're, if it's your first time watching with us online or visiting with us today, just text that word CONNECT to that number. There we go, 254-218-3100, and we will send you a digital, um, just a digital card. This is a safe card to fill out. We're not going to call you. We're not going to come to your house. Amen. Nobody's going to show up at your house and knocking on your door. All we want to do is send you one letter just welcoming you and letting you know what your next steps are in your relationship with the Lord and in your relationship with Legacy Church, how you can get involved if you want to. It's no pressure. We just want to connect with you and be able to keep in touch with you. Also, same number. Go ahead, everybody that's here. If you're watching online, take out your phone. This is the time you can actually use your phone in church. As they say now, let's, let's turn our Bibles on. So take out your phone and text the word NOTES to that same number, 254-218-3100. We have digital notes for you online. We're trying to keep everything touch-free. So we have digital notes for you online. You can follow along with today's message and all of the scriptures and everything is right there for you to follow along. So today, let me give you a little background in um, why we're talking about what we're talking about today. Today I'm going to preach on validation. Validation. How many of you ever felt inferior? Ever felt like you weren't capable of doing what God has called you to do? I'm the only one. Well, praise the Lord. Right? No, we've all felt that, haven't we? We've all felt at some point in time in our lives incapable of doing what God has called us to do. If you've always felt capable of every vision that you have from the Lord, let me let you in a little secret. It's probably not God. If you feel fully confident that you can do it, it's probably not God. Because every time God calls us to do something, it usually requires a massive step of faith. And it requires to step out of our own capabilities and our own abilities and our own talents and our own gifts and to do something way beyond anything that we could ever do on our own. And the Lord has really been dealing with my heart the last few weeks, and, and I feel like the Lord is calling us as a church family to a deeper place of prayer. So over the next few weeks, I'm going to be talking about prayer. We're going to have some opportunities to pray throughout the week. We're going to do some online prayers, and we're going to do some prayer, some opportunities to pray corporately together in person as well. And so the Lord's really been laying that on my heart, and I want to put that in your spirit, just prepare you over the next couple of weeks to be hearing about that. And 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 to ask the Holy Spirit what he would have you to do, because if the Lord's laid it on my heart, it's probably for you too. And so as we're talking about prayer, and I said, all right, Lord, well, then I'll preach on prayer. And then the Holy Spirit really led me in a different direction. said, no, you can't preach on prayer until we start talking about validation. And I know what you're thinking, because it's the same thing I was thinking. What does that have to do with the other, right? What does validation have to do with prayer? And what I felt like was for so many of us, we feel so devalued or so much like we're not worthy, we're not worth it, that we can't even pray for the things that God wants us to pray for. We can't even step into asking God for the stuff that he wants us to ask him for. How many of you know prayer is not just a, a, a lifeline? Prayer, while it is that, prayer isn't just a, hey, help me, save me, because I don't know what I'm going to do, right? It's not just a last-ditch effort. Prayer is not a life preserver, right? It's not like I'm drowning. I've done everything that I can do. I've tried everything else. The last thing I'm going to do, let me try to pray. I have tried to bail out the water. I have tried to fix the hole in the ship. I have tried to do everything that I could possibly do. There's nothing left. I guess now I'll pray. No, that's not what prayer is. Prayer is so much more than that. And when the Lord has called us to pray, let me tell you something. He wants you to ask for stuff that you could never get. He wants you to believe him for the impossible. Just a couple of weeks ago, I preached a message called Losing the Fear of the Impossible. If you haven't seen it yet, go back to our Facebook archives and watch that. Losing the Fear of the Impossible. God wants you to pray and believe for impossible things. He doesn't just want you to pray and believe to barely scrape by, to barely make it, to barely, barely just live life. No, he wants you to live an overflowing, abundant, more that you can ask 
or think or imagine kind of a life. He wants you to believe him for the impossible. And so before we can really grasp that and understand that, we've got to know that God has already validated us. He's already found worth in us, and he's already found us to be worthy to receive those things. How many of you know it can be difficult to feel like you're worthy to receive anything from God? Right? I'm not, I know I'm not the only one. It can be hard to even ask him for stuff. It feels like, well, should I even ask the Lord for that? I feel guilty about this, or I'm not worthy, or I don't pray enough, I don't read enough, I don't seek the word enough, I don't do this enough or that enough, I don't look the certain way and act a certain way. And I know that people have spoken words over me, and I've received prophecies, but I don't dress that good, and I don't have that kind of car, and I don't have that kind of money, and I don't come from that kind of family, and I don't have those kind of muscles and that kind of waist and this kind of this, that, the other, right? Anybody ever feel that way? Like all of the stuff, we make all of our list of what makes somebody successful, what validates a person, and we don't fit all of those criteria. And so we feel like we can't even ask God or believe God to fulfill what he's already spoken over us. So I want to take you to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Some of you know exactly where I'm going. But 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16 is the story of David. Now, I love David. I love David. I love Psalms. I love David. David was, the Bible says, a man after God's own heart. Then you read the story of David and you go, well, hold up just a second. What you mean David was a man after God's own heart? David was an adulterer. David was a murderer. Actually, he murdered somebody, right? He had him killed. He didn't get his own hands dirty, you know. David was a boss, so he had him killed, right? David did all these things, and the, and the Bible still says that David was a man after God's own heart. He disobeyed the Lord. I mean, not just a little bit, like heard God speak and did the opposite of what God told him to do. He did all of these things, yet he was still called a man after God's own heart. Why? Because God had validated David. Not man, not what we look at. But God had looked upon his heart and said, you know what David is? David is a human. He's not perfect. He doesn't have it all together, but his heart is after mine. And so we, when I was reading this story, and the Lord took me to it, and, and I spent hours going through this, reading this chapter over and over, and like, Lord, I'm not seeing what you're showing me. The Lord really took me through how he spoke to Samuel. Samuel was the high priest at the time for Israel. Let me give you a little backstory. See, Samuel had anointed Saul to become king. And Saul was the leader of Israel, and he was king. And things were really going badly in the nation. And Saul uh, had lost his way and wasn't serving the Lord and, and was really an evil man and, and was doing the opposite of what God had called him to do. And Samuel was mourning that. He was really mourning the loss of the king. He was mourning what God had called Saul to do, and he knew that the Lord had call, called Saul, and so he was mourning that. And he was having a difficult time moving on from the old thing that God had called and moving to the new place that God had called him to be in. And he was struggling. And then the Lord began to speak to Samuel, and as we go through this story, I'm going to point out how we can see what does God look for when he's validating and what does man look for. Let's go to chapter 1. 1 Samuel 16, sorry, verse 1, not chapter 1. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn? I'm going to read 13 verses. I know, settle in because I'm actually going to read the Bible in church. <laughs> like a lot of scripture in church. I know it's, we're not used to that, right? But I'm going <laughs> to, just kidding, we do that at Legacy. But we're going to read the Bible in church. So just settle in. It's not going to be too long. But let's go to, we're going to read 13 verses. Take a deep breath. All right, let's go. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You're to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? 
Samuel said, yes, in peace I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. Somebody said amen. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab. That's a name right there. And had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. He will, we will not sit down until he arrives. So he went for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. That's pretty clear, huh? No, not really, is it? Right? That's not, not exactly clear on what what the Lord is looking for when he's looking to validate and what it means. But we, there, are some, there are some nuggets within that story that I want to go through today. I'm not going to take too much time, but I want us to go through and pick out some nuggets. Let's pray before we do that. Father, do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Some of y'all want to invite me over for Thanksgiving now. Pray over the meal. Bless the food. Amen. So we're going to talk about the don'ts first. There are a lot of things that we look for when we're looking for validation within ourselves and within other people. We live in a society that we are constantly trying to validate ourselves and validate other people. We're always trying to measure, aren't we? We're trying to measure ourselves, and often the way that we use to measure ourselves is by pointing out and picking out the flaws in others. Because we feel like, well, at least I'm not like this person. My house may be messy, but have you seen so-and-so's house? Woo! At least it don't look like that, right? I might have put on a few pounds, but have you seen so-and-so? I saw that Instagram, and even with all the filters, at least I don't look like that, right? I may not be that holy. I may have some struggles, but did you hear about homeboy and what he was going through? Woo! At least I don't have that problem, right? We're always trying to measure ourselves and measure other people. Let's go to verse 1 here uh, in chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? You see, Samuel was mourning not for even temporal things, but he was mourning for what God had called. God called Saul. The Lord anointed Saul to be king, and he used Samuel to, to, uh, to validate that and to validate the call upon Saul's life. And he told Samuel, how long are you going to mourn for this? See, I've rejected him as king over Israel. He said, I know that you've been mourning for this man, and I know what I, what I told you before, but I've rejected him as king. I'm moving on. He was telling Samuel, don't mourn missed opportunities. You see, Saul was a missed opportunity. It was God's will for Saul to be king. Did you know that sometimes God's will is not fulfilled? Shock, I know, right? I know God is sovereign, but we have, we have free will. We have the opportunity to listen to God and do what he says or to not do what he says. The Bible says that, hey, man, I have put before you good and evil. Choose which path you're going to take. We have free will. We have the ability to choose. And Saul was given that ability. He was given a word from God. He was given the authority that he needed. He was even given the, the position officially, and he chose to disobey the Lord. So the Lord rejected him as king and spoke to Samuel and said, stop mourning the things of the past. Stop mourning missed opportunities. For some of us in the room today, we need to stop mourning missed opportunities. We need to stop mourning missed relationships that we've had. 
things that we were holding on to that we thought this was the one, this was the thing, this was the person. Maybe it was even a marriage for you. Maybe you, 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 you come from a broken home. Maybe it was with your own parents or it was a deep relationship that you were in love with somebody. Maybe it was a job, a career path that you knew God called you to, but because of maybe some of your own mistakes or some of the decisions and the mistakes of other people, that did not work out. And the Lord would say today, stop mourning missed opportunities. How long are you going to mourn what I said before? And when are you going to pick up the fresh word of what I'm saying today? Let's go to verse 2. It says, and I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he's going to kill me. Now, you have to understand, Saul was already not a great dude, right? This was not a good man. This was an evil king. And he happened to be king in a time when the king had all power and all authority. The king could do whatever he wanted to do, right? Listen, the president of the United States, no matter who he is, doesn't have all power and all authority, but I still don't want to tick him off, right? How many of you want to make the president mad? You probably don't want to make the, an enemy of the president or the governor or even the mayor of your town. You, you really don't want to make an enemy with those people, right? Now imagine if he had all power and all authority and all immunity. He could do whatever he wanted. He could kill you, your family, burn your house to the ground, take all of your stuff, and nobody's going to do anything to him. So Samuel said, wait a second, God. You want me to travel across the land. You want me to anoint somebody else as king and expect Saul not to hear about it? No, sir. No, sir. I'm not about to do that and be killed, right? He knew that if Saul heard about it, he was going to kill him. And, and so he was so concerned with what other people were thinking. He was so concerned about what Saul was thinking. The don't for this one is don't fear the opinions of others. Listen, just thank God that you're not in the position of Samuel, that you don't have anybody that can kill you. All you have is people that can talk bad about you. Thank the Lord, right? I know that people talking about you can hurt. You know that old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That is such a lie. Such a lie. It's not even funny. Like mo many times, I'd much rather have sticks and stones than some of the things people have said. Those can be hurtful and last a long time. Wounds you get over, but words can hurt for years and decades to come. So I, I know that it can be painful, and I know that it can hurt, but we can't fear the opinions of other people when we're looking for the validation of the Father, when we're trying to follow his will and his way and his call and his purpose on our life. We can't fear the opinions of other people. Somebody said once, if nobody's talking about you, you're not doing anything. I'm going to say that again over here to this side. If nobody's talking about you, you're probably not doing anything right? If you don't feel opposition, it probably means that you're not taking any ground. Anytime you're feeling opposition from others and certainly from the enemy, you feel that in the spirit, it means that you're taking ground. It means that you're moving forward. Don't confuse your opposition with failure. Don't confuse a pressing from the enemy with a failure in your own life. Maybe, just maybe, that is a sign that you're on the right path, that you're going down the right track, that when people start running you down and talking about you and saying how crazy you are, man, that Aaron, he's lost his mind. Did you hear what he said he was going to do? Did you hear what Brill said he was going to do and how they've stepped out and what they're going to do for the Lord and what they think is the call of God that's on their life and where they think they're going? Maybe, just maybe, that, that means that your God dream, that your dream is actually a God dream. Because if everybody in your life thinks that you can do it, it's probably not from the Lord. He's going to call you to step outside of anything that you thought you could do. Let's go to verses 6 and 7 says this, and when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. 
The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, Samuel showed up, and even Samuel, this incredible man of God, this great high priest, he even had in his mind some preconceived ideas and notions of what God and the kind of person that God was going to call, right? He showed up, and, and Samuel said to Jesse, bring your sons. And you know Jesse brought out the biggest, baddest, toughest, best-looking son that he had, right? He said, well, this must be the one. He was tall. He was probably built, good-looking, had it together, had a great personality, big pearly whites, right, big smile, probably had it all going on. He brought him before. And Samuel said, well, surely this is the one that the Lord has called, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about, the golden boy. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The one that, that you just look at and you go, man, that, that, that person just must have it. I sure wish I was more like that, right? I wish I had that height. I wish I had those muscles. I wish I had that personality. I wish I had that, that much, that, I wish I was that dynamic. I wish I had it all together like that person. You know, we all have these things, these ideas of who God can use and, and the kind of person that, that he's looking for. And even Samuel had that idea in his head. And even Jesse had that idea in his head. That's who he brought out first. And the Lord told him, he said, now, don't consider his appearance. Don't consider his height. The Lord does not look at the things that other people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The next don't here is don't focus on the wrong things. Stop focusing on the wrong stuff when we're looking for validation. See, so many of us in our own lives, we're looking and we're focusing on the wrong things. We hear a call from the Lord. We know that God has called us to do something, and we start focusing in our lives on the wrong stuff. We start pointing out all the reasons why we can't do what God has called us to do. All the reasons why you can't start that business. All the reasons why you can't step out in faith and do that thing that the Lord has placed on your heart. The reasons why you could never fulfill that prophetic word that was spoken over you. The reasons why you could never step into what you know God told you he's called you to step into in prayer. We've got all of these lists of things and these reasons because we're focusing on the wrong stuff. Don't focus on the wrong things. Let's go to verses 10 and 11. And Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons that you have? And Jesse said, They're still the youngest. He's tending the sheep, Samuel said. Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So Jesse had seven boys. Now, you know Jesse was thinking, I got seven kids. I got seven men, seven young men in my home. Surely one of these are going to work right? He brings him, and you know Jesse had to start sweating a little bit, and probably Samuel was sweating a little bit too. Let's be honest. So Samuel hears from the Lord to go and anoint one of Jesse's sons, and then he starts bringing kid after kid, and the Lord said, nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. And you know Samuel had to start thinking, maybe I missed it. You know, maybe I missed God. I know I didn't travel all this way put my neck out here. Somebody's going to hear about this little excursion. Saul is going to kill me. I've done all this. I've said that the Lord spoke to me. None of these kids are the one that God's called. What am I doing here? And he's, I can just hear maybe the little crack in Samuel's voice when he said, surely, <clears throat> surely you have another son. <laughs> right? Surely there's somebody else that maybe you've called. Maybe, maybe you have. Surely I'm, I can't be missing it. And Jesse said, well, yeah, I, I've got the youngest son, but he's out in the field, right? He's the least qualified of all of them. He's out in the field. He's just, he's just out there tending some sheep. And that's the next don't. Don't overlook what's right in front of you. Sometimes the thing that feels like your biggest weakness is actually your greatest strength. Sometimes that thing that feels like the weight that's holding you down is actually that thing that's going to propel, propel you to the next place that God's called you to be. Don't overlook the thing that is sitting right in front of you. And I'm going to go to what I'm going to call the five D's. 
because y'all know I've told you this before. There's some kind of preacher disease. I don't get it. But we always try to rhyme. Y'all know this. We always try to rhyme or try to start it with the same letter or something. But this, <laughs> it's okay to laugh. And uh, so I'm going to call this one the five Ds. And the only reason we do this because I feel like it's easier to remember, right? How many of you went to a New Year's Eve service and heard a preacher preach on 2020? Anybody go to a New Year's Eve service and, and tell you how great 2020 was going to be? Anybody want to write him a letter now? I just want to say I didn't say that. I just want to point that out. Anybody want to go back to that New Year's Eve service and go, excuse me, I want a refund. All right, let's go to, uh, back to verse 1. We're going to go back through this again, and now we're going to point out. So we pointed out the don'ts, and now we're going to point out the do's, right? These are the five D's here that the Lord is looking for. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I've rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. So what does that mean, right? Fill your horn with oil. How many of you have a horn of oil with you? Probably not many of us. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. All that meant, that oil is a representation of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So what the Lord was speaking to Samuel was, get anointed and go on your way. You have mourned missed opportunities long enough. You have set in your place of missed opportunities. You've been living in the place of broken relationships. You've been living in the place of bankruptcy. You've been living in the place of failed businesses. You've been living in the place of I got laid off. I got fired from my job. My kid didn't turn out the way I expected them to. I gained the weight back after I lost it. I got injured. I've been in sickness. I've had this, that, or the other. I'm living in the place of missed opportunities. And the Lord says, get up, stop mourning that, get anointed, and move on. So the first D is drink. Drink. Fill your horn. Get anointed. Get anointed. I almost said get drunk. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Somebody said, what? What, what kind of church is this? Y'all be back next week. <laughs> get anointed and move on. Drink. Drink from his presence. Get drunk in the presence of God. What do I mean by that? That sounds a little weird, doesn't it? Okay, well, we're a little weird. But what I mean by that is get so inebriated with the Holy Spirit that you lose all of your inhibitions. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise your hand because I'm not going to front you out like that. But, but some of us in this room have been drunk before. And when you get drunk, you feel like you can fight the biggest dude in the bar, right? Like you forget that you're much smaller and shorter and you don't quite fill in and fit all of the stuff that needs to fit to win this fight, right? You forgot you weren't in there working out. You forgot you don't have prison muscles like the dude that you're stepping up to right now, right? You don't have, you don't have a, 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 a blade in your lip like the girl that you're stepping up to right now, right? You forgot because you've been drinking too much. You've lost all of it. Some of us need to drink from the presence of God. Some of us need to drink from the Holy Spirit and just lose all of our inhibitions. Just get so drunk with the presence that we say, you know what? I may not be big and bad. I may not have it all together, but I know who's got my back. I've lost all fear, all worry, all inhibition. I'll just say whatever comes to my mind. I'm so drunk in the Holy Spirit, I just might tell you what God just showed me about you. I'm so drunk in the Holy Spirit, I might just speak out what God just spoke into my mind, even though it sounds crazy, even though it sounds insane, even though it sounds like there's no way that I can do it. I might just step out in faith and do what God's called me to do. Somebody pick up your horn of oil. Get anointed, get drunk, leave the place of mourning, and go. Come on, let's move. See, it, all the, the, the word from the Lord that some of us, some of us have been playing on the outskirts. We've, we've been just tasting enough to get a little bit tipsy. Come on, this is from the Lord. This is what I heard from God preparing this message. We've been playing on, the, we've, we've, we've tasted the Holy Spirit just enough to kind of feel a little bit of a buzz, but the Lord is calling us to go all the way in. 
The Lord is calling some of you to just take the leap of faith, to step all the way in, and to get so drunk in the Holy Spirit that you lose it all. All the fear, all the doubt, all the worry, and you just say whatever he puts in your spirit to say. Do whatever he puts in your spirit to do. Let's go to, back to verse 1, the next part says, I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he'll kill me. And then the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. I'm going to tell a little story here because this is really funny. But when my wife was young, she didn't know what heifer was. And she was sitting around the, the supper table with her family. And she looked at her grandma and she said, she called her a lion heifer. And her grandmother came jumping across. How I many don't mess with the southern grandma raised in Arkansas? Because she'll cut you, right? She came crawling across the table, just about jump up over there. Her mom was like, no, 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 she doesn't know what that means. So listen, heifer is a cow. Don't be calling people a heifer, okay? Especially not your grandma. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I'll show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one that I indicate. So the Lord told Samuel, Samuel said, I'm afraid. Samuel said, wait a second, I have an enemy out there. Saul is my enemy. If Saul hears what I'm about to go do, if Saul hears that I've heard from God and I'm going to go and do something that he doesn't want, he's going to take my life, Lord. And what did God tell him to do? What did God tell Samuel to do to confuse the enemy? He told Samuel to bring a sacrifice. He said, if you want to confound your enemy, go get a heifer, consecrate yourself, and sacrifice before the Lord. The second D is to dwell. Dwell in his presence. You want to confuse your enemy? Begin to worship. You want to confuse the opposition? Go get a heifer. Bring a sacrifice. You see, it's not difficult to worship the Lord when everything's going well. It's not difficult to praise God when you just close the biggest deal of your career. It's not difficult to praise the Lord when all the bills are paid and the, the, the husband is happy, the wife is happy, the kids are doing great. There's not some scourge of a virus running around the whole world, right? It's not difficult to praise the Lord when, when the job is good and the weather is nice and the birds are chirping and the angels are singing and ah, everything just seems to be working out perfectly for you. That's not difficult to praise the Lord. But you know when you confound the enemy is when he has come against you with everything that he's got. He has tried to confuse you and take you out at the knees and harm you and put every obstacle in your way that is possible that you could ever think or imagine might happen, and you still bring a sacrifice of praise. You still bring a worship. You still dwell in the presence of the Lord. That brings confusion to the enemy. See, Saul couldn't touch Samuel as long as he was bringing a sacrifice to God. He couldn't come near to Samuel because he wouldn't dare touch the high priest as he was bringing a sacrifice. See, if, if Samuel had come with what I'm sure was in his mind to come with, if he would have come with carnal weapons against Saul, if he would have said, hey, Saul, if he hears about this, he's going to kill me. I better go get an army. I better arm myself. I better prepare myself for what Saul can do to me. I better get some weapons some people around me, get a posse, get an army. I better protect myself. I better step into my own carnality and my own flesh and protect myself. See, if he would have done that, Samuel would have easily, or Saul would have easily overcome him, but he didn't. He didn't step into his carnal weapons, and our carnal weapons are, are often anger or revenge, aggression, self-righteousness. We step into those things when our enemy comes against us, don't we? We step into that. We, 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 we step into what's familiar to us. We step into what we think will work. You going to talk about me? Well, I'm going to talk about you. You going to come for me? I'm going to come for you. There's a song that was out. I think it's hilarious. But he said, try Jesus, but don't try me. <laughs> hilarious song. It's not really biblical, but it's really funny. <laughs> 
But that's how we do, right? Try Jesus, don't try me, right? We step into that. We think that we've got to be tough and we've got the carnal weapons and we're going to do all of these things and we're going to protect ourselves. When the Lord says, hold on just a second, why don't you pick up the weapons of the Spirit? See, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers that exalt themselves in high places above the knowledge of God. We are not wrestling against the flesh. We are wrestling against the spirit. And so we've got to pick up spiritual weapons. Listen, we don't come in here and praise and worship God just because it feels good. Praise and worship we give worth and glory and honor to God, but there's a second part of that. It's also a weapon. There's a psalm that said, this is how I fight my battles. It's not just a song. It's not just a phrase. But as believers, the way that we fight the enemy, the way that we fight our battles is by giving worth to God is by worshiping the Lord, not just in the good times, but in the difficult times as well. See, I'm not real interested in what the enemy is doing. See, a lot of people are running around, what's the devil doing? What's the enemy doing? What's the spirit over this place? And what's the spirit here? And what's the enemy doing here? And what's the enemy doing there? What they saying in this neighborhood? And what's the spirit over here? There's poverty in this neighborhood. There's this, that, and the other going on. No, no, I'm not real interested in what the enemy is doing. I want to know what is my father doing? What is Abba doing? How can I come into alignment with what his will is? How can I worship and exalt and, and amplify his voice and his will? Instead, Samuel came and walked across enemy territories, not with his own carnal weapons, but with a humble heifer, with a sacrifice. He knew if he dwelled in the presence of the Lord, he could overcome it all. Let's move on to verse 3. And they ask, do you come in peace? See, Samuel showed up to Bethlehem, and the elders greeted him, and the Bible says that they were terrified. They were shaking. They were fearful. And they said, wait a second. Do you come in peace? You see, they were terrified because they knew that they weren't consecrated. They didn't want to meet the high priest with what was on their life, with the things that they were dealing with, the lack of consecration in their lives. And he said to them, yeah, yeah, I come in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Now go and consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. And then he moves on and says, then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So number three, the third D is to dive. Consecrate yourself and dive into the word. Dive into the word with all that we have. The word is healing. The word is alive. And the word will wash you and cleanse you. The word, the Bible says that we need to be washed in the word every day. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand again, but most of us take a shower every day, right? I really hope that y'all y'all do. It's not a very big building, so... Most of us take a shower every day. We wash ourselves daily. Why? Because you get dirty. And life just kind of attaches itself to you. And you get dirty, and the longer you go without washing, the dirtier that you get. And the same thing happens with our spirit. We've got to dive into the Word of God and consecrate ourselves if we're looking to step into the call that God has placed on us. You see, he couldn't see... What God, uh, he could not see what God saw. Jesse couldn't see what God saw until he was consecrated, until he was set aside, until he was removed from the world. And Samuel couldn't see what God saw in Jesse's sons until he consecrated himself. They said, hey, before we even go and attempt to figure out who God's called to be king, we better step aside and consecrate ourselves. We better step aside and pray. We better step aside and remove ourselves from the world and consecrate ourselves. You see, we've got to remove our earthly vision in order to see in the spirit. You've got to take off your flesh goggles and put on your spiritual glasses. We've got to be able to remove what we see in the natural so that we can see in the spirit. Well, we will forever be seeking validation as long as we're looking at ourselves through the lens of the flesh 
and not through the lens of the Spirit. But if you're not consecrated, you will look at yourselves and others through the lens of the flesh. We will measure ourselves and others the way Samuel and Jesse were first measuring. Well, surely this is the man that God's called. He's tall. He's good looking. He's dynamic. He's got all of these worldly things that, that, that would tell me this is who God wants to use. But you've got to remove the lens of the spirit and look through the lens of the flesh. Remove the lens of the flesh and look through the lens of the spirit. How do we do that? We do that through diving into the word through washing ourselves in the word. Now, let me say this, because I want us to be careful. I don't want to put things on you. I spend a lot of time teaching us and talking about not striving, right? Not trying to earn favor from the Lord. Let me say this. If you missed reading the word, it does not mean you're going to hell. Okay? If you didn't do your quiet time, it does not mean that you are less than. It does not mean that, well, I, I missed it. I better catch up. I better go back. Every, anybody have an app, right? If you don't, there's a Bible, the, the Bible app is what it's called, and it's awesome. And you can do the Bible in one year, and it's a great reading plan. And every day when you finish the reading plan, it does a little check. Check. And then it's got like a little, all the numbers up there, and it tells you what day, and then they've got it checked. And then if you miss a day, it's not checked. And it'll tell you how many days that you've missed it just mocks you. You've missed three days. You've missed 46 days, right? And it's like when you get to heaven, you feel like God's going to go, well, you were going to come in, but I've got this little app here, and it tells me that you missed 37 days last year, so I'm sorry, going down, right? <laughs> or like when we go before the Lord and we're praying and we're seeking God for whatever it is, that we're at, we feel like, well, I really can't ask God for that because I missed, I missed three days last week in my Bible reading plan. And it must, no, no, no. I, don't take that upon yourself. Somebody just, just shake it off. Come on, just shake it off. The Bible is a gift to us. It's not meant to be a weight around our neck. The Bible is meant to be a precious gift, something that uplifts and encourages, not that beats you down. The Bible is as sharp as a double-edged sword. It separates the wheat from the tear. It's not a blunt object for which we should be beat about the head and neck with. It's a scalpel. It takes and removes those things that will harm you. It removes the cancer that, if left alone, will eat your body away and disintegrate your spirit. That's what the Bible does. It doesn't beat you and bludgeon you and hurt you and bruise you. That is what the enemy does. The enemy perverts the word and turns the Bible, the sword of the word, into a club. I could preach on that for a minute. Don't allow that to happen. Verse 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. Say it with me. Say, the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. We've got to search our heart. We've got to search our own heart. We've got to go to this fourth D. We've got to die. I knew I wouldn't get a whole lot of amens to that. What you mean we got to die? What kind of church is this? First you said get drunk, and now you said die. You about to bring out the red Kool-Aid? No, we're not. <laughs> what do I mean by die? I mean we've got to die to ourselves daily. We've got to pick up our cross, take up the mind of Christ, and die to our flesh every day. You, we've all been in that relationship where you had to break up with somebody, and you said, what's the famous line? It's not you. It's me. Right? You've all said that, and y'all were lying. You know you were lying through too, because you know it was actually them. Because if it was really you, you'd fix yourself, right? It was me. I better fix it, because I like them. No, no, no. You don't like them. It was them. You don't like the way they chew. You don't like the way they, they dress. You don't like the way they talk. There were 14 red flags before, and then you said, it's not you. It's me. Lying, lying, lying. It's okay. The Lord will forgive you for that. But I want us to say, hey, we're not going to do that. It's not you, it's me. It's, it's not me, it's you. That's the phrase that we should have. You see, we, we seek, we don't think we're worth it because we're actually walking not in humility but in pride. 
So see, the enemy twists and turns, and he makes us think that when we feel less than capable of doing what God's called us to do, we're somehow walking in humility, but actually you're walking in pride. Why? Because you're saying, no, it's not you, God, it's me, and I can't do it. But when we step back and go, wait a second, this has nothing to do with me and everything to do with God, that's true humility. And when you're walking in true humility, there's nothing that you can't do. When you're walking in true humility, there's nothing that you can't accomplish because you can recognize and know it's not me, it's you. It's not my my ability, it's not my talents, it's not my gifts, it's not my money, it's not my anointing, it's you. I give it all to you. You see, we spend all of our time trying to fix the stuff within us that don't matter to God. We're trying to fix all of the things that he doesn't care about. You see, God doesn't look on the outward appearance, but he looks at the heart, and we are working on all of the stuff that everybody else cares about, and God's saying, stop messing with that. That has nothing to do with what I'm looking for. We're trying to fix our makeup, our intellect, our money, our pocketbooks, our weight, our power, our money, our fame, our fashion. We're trying to get all of that stuff together and in line. And God said, I'm looking for your heart. And we measure ourselves and others through the things that are temporal. And he is all the while looking inward at the things that are eternal. And when we begin to measure ourselves with others, we step into a spirit and a place and a lifestyle of comparison. And comparison is a thief. Comparison will steal your joy. It will steal your peace. It will steal your hope. It will steal your future. Comparison is what stole the kingship from Saul. Stop comparing. Comparing yourself, not only to others, but to your own self, to the way that you used to be, the way that you used to look, the way that you used to act, the way that you used to have this, that, and the other. And I used to have fill in the blank, and we compare and compare and compare, and the Lord said, stop it. I, I, I'm, I'm looking at your heart. We go to verse 10. We're moving along. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all of your sons? You see, God didn't choose any of the sons that were standing around waiting to be chosen. Jesse had to be getting nervous because he said, these are all of the men. These are, all I've got is some boy that's out covered in, in sheep fur. You know, he stinks. He's out in the field. He's a young kid. He, 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 he's not even 5'6", whatever. I don't know. And he's out there in the field like, these are, the, these are the, the, the guys, the men that I've brought before. I know it's got to be one of these seven sons. And, but God didn't choose any of those young men that were standing around waiting to be chosen. He chose the one that was in the field tending to what mattered to his father. You see, a lot of men, a lot of those guys, those sons were standing around and they were primping and they were probably, they were doing push-ups and they were getting ready and they were pumping themselves up and getting excited and getting a shave and a haircut and making sure they had all this together and getting their clothes ready and, and putting on their oils and their perfumes and making sure that they were together and they were waiting for the man of God to show up to pick them. They were the ones in the green room before the service and talking to the man of God. They were the ones that were, while the worship was going on, they were rubbing elbows and schmoozing and making relationships and making connections, right? And then there was a young man who didn't seem to have it all together, but he was out in the field, and he was with the sheep, and he was tending to what mattered to his father. He was busy. He was working the field. He was worshiping. He was bringing all that he had. He was singing songs and spiritual songs in the field. While they were making connections, he was being connected. He was tending the sheep. And the next verse says this, there's still the youngest, Jesse answered, he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Notice they had to send 
for David. While everybody else was waiting, was standing around, was available, David wasn't available. They had to send for him because he was out doing. He was taking care of the sheep. And the next verse says, so he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. See, David was healthy. While he wasn't seeking for validation from anyone but his father, he was still all the while taking care of himself. You see, while the Lord doesn't focus on the outward, but he focuses on the inward, it doesn't mean that we, we have no responsibility to be healthy. David was still healthy, but the difference was the spirit that David operated in. Come on, get this. He wasn't healthy so that he would look the part. He wasn't healthy so that he would be aesthetically pleasing. He wasn't healthy just so that he could stand around and wait for somebody to tap him on the shoulder and say, it's your time. No, he was taking care of himself so that he would be ready to serve when called upon. See, he ate well, and he drank plenty of water, and he got plenty of exercise so that when the Lord was ready for him, he was ready to be chosen. David was healthy. The Bible says he was glowing with health. He was healthy in his physical body, and he was healthy in his spirit. It's important. But he had the right spirit about it. And the next verse says this, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, and he did it in the presence of his brothers. I love that. You see, when God's ready to call you out, he'll call you out in public. All the work and the, the, the time that you spent with the Lord in private, God will honor it in public. He called him out in the presence of his brothers, and from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David, and Samuel then went to Ramah. I get it, some keys up here. From that day on, the power and the presence of the Lord was upon David. And so the fifth D, number five, is to do. All right. Number five is to do. Be healthy and serve the sheep. We drink. Fill up your horn with oil. Drink from the presence of God. Go and get anointed. Dwell. Bring a sacrifice before the Lord. Bring a sacrifice of worship. Die. Die to your... Dive. I'm sorry. Consecrate yourself in the Word of God. Dive into the Word day in and day out. Wash yourself in the Word. Die to ourself. It's not me. It's you. And finally, go and do. You see, so many times we get stuck in these first four steps. We get stuck in that relationship building phase with the Lord. It's like you ever met a person who's been engaged for seven years, right? They've been engaged for seven, they've been dating for like, how long have you been dating? 11 years. You just, you look at the woman and you're like, Oh, um, <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, right. And sometimes you just want to go, hey, you've done all of these things, and you've gotten to know, and you've built the relationship. It's time to step out and go and do. You see, many of us have been dating the Lord for long enough. We've been engaged to God for long enough, and he said, okay, I know you needed some healing. I know you needed some time. I know you needed that intimate time with me, and that's not going to stop, but it's time to make this official. If you like it, it's time to put a ring on it, right? It's time to make this official. It's time to dive deeper with me. It's time to step out and not just drink, right? Not just drink in my presence, not just get drunk in the presence of God, not just dwell and worship and, and all of that intimacy and that beautiful feeling of worshiping the Lord. And not even just diving into the Word and studying and studying. Let me tell you something. So people can get trapped in studying the Word. And all you do is you use those scriptures that you've memorized and learned as a weapon to beat up on yourself and to beat up on other people. 
It's not even just to die because so many times we spend so much time dying that we forget that he's also the resurrection. You don't die to die. You die to live. You got to take step five and step out and do. You got to do. God's placed some things within every single person in, within the sound of my voice, whether you're watching online or you're here in person today. God has placed gifts and talents and anointings within you. And I believe with all of my heart, he's calling you to step out and do today. Everybody, if you would, just bow your head and close your eyes. Nobody looking around. I think for many of us today, guys, that the time of flirting with the Lord is come to an end. We're going to stop dating around, and it's time to get serious. Some of us, you feel that conviction power of the Holy Spirit. You feel the Lord saying, okay, it's time. It's not about perfection. Remember, David was messed up. He was jacked up. He stunk. He was out in the field. He didn't have it all together. He had a lot of issues. He had sin in his life. He had flesh and stuff that he had to deal with constantly throughout his life. But the Lord still called him. And the reason he was able to be used by God was not because he was perfect. It was because he was willing. It was just because he was willing. He was willing to step out and do. He gave the Lord his yes. And today, some of us need to give God our yes. Some of us need to give God our yes today. If you're watching online, if you're here in person, and you say, Pastor, I, I feel something. I feel like the Lord is convicting me. He's grabbing my heart today. The first step, the first step, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't have a relationship, if you haven't asked him into your heart, that's the first step, is to ask Jesus to come into your heart, is to make that decision to stop flirting with him and to make it official, to say, I'm going to accept his sacrifice today. If that is you, I want you to just lift your hand. Nobody's looking. Nobody's watching. Just lift your hand if that's you. Thank you. If that's you online, just lift your hand. If you're online, we want to connect with you. Text the word CONNECT to 254-218-3100. We want to connect with you. We want to help you in this journey. Send us a private message or text that number. We'll get in touch with you. We'll send you information. We want to connect with you. But first, I want to pray. I want everybody in the room to pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come before you just as I am. I give you all that I've got, my heart. I lay it before you. I ask that you would save me, that you would heal me, I say yes to you today. I thank you that in a moment, you can change everything. That in a moment, you can turn my life upside down. I give you my heart today. And I will live for you as you show me how. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And for others of us, either online or in the room today, maybe you've got a relationship with the Lord and you've been saved, and some of you have been saved for years, but you said, I, I haven't taken that step. I haven't stepped out to do what I know God's called me to do. Some of us don't even know what that is. That's all right. We want to help you figure that out. 
That's the vision of Legacy Church. Live in God, move in freedom, and be on purpose. It's that simple. It's that simple. That's the vision that Jesus has for all of us. You see, he doesn't just want us to be saved. Salvation is not a get out of hell free card. Salvation means nothing lacking and nothing broken. He don't just want you to make it to eternity. He wants you to have a great time on your way there. There's nothing better than living for Jesus. And I promise you the happiest people that you know are the people that are making an impact in the lives of others. I promise you. And if you're not doing that, we want to help you figure out what that is for your life. Whatever that is, if it's teaching some kids, if it's greeting people at the front doors, if it's serving the homeless, if it's, if it's through giving, if it's through worship, if it's through using your talents as an instrument or singing or in, in, in the, on a camera or whatever it is. This is not because we need help. This is because you need an outlet. You need to put your hands to what God has called you to do. That's where joy and peace and happiness can really come from. That's fulfillment. When we live in God, you hear the voice of the Lord and you step out and do it. You move in freedom where you can take off the mask and truly be free. Not just be saved, but be free. I'm going to have t-shirts made that said, I'm free and holy. Right? We can be holy and free. Some people think, if I'm holy, I got to be bound. No, you can be both. You can walk in freedom and to walk out your purpose, the purpose of God that is on your life. Y'all, this is not a, an infomercial. I believe in what I'm telling you. My wife knows me. I, I don't have a good fake meter. I just don't have. I don't, I don't have. I cannot be fake. I, there's somebody asked me to do a meeting with them. And I was talking to a mentor in my life. I'm like, these people asked me. I met with them like three times. I already know what they're going to say. And they're like, look, pastor, you don't have a good fake. You, you just can't do it. If you meet with them, it's not going to end well. So just don't do it. <laughs> I don't have a good, I, I can't be fake. I'm not being fake with y'all. I'm being, I believe in this. This is not an infomercial. But we've got small groups starting. Our, we call them home crews. Home crews. And they're life-changing. They will touch your life. They will forever change you. Why? Because real life change happens in the context of relationships. It's not just here, but it's when we can get together in smaller groups and remove the mask and begin to talk and begin to, I know, remove the mask like now in 2020 has a double entendre, but, you know, I mean like the anyways, y'all get it. We can, we can be real with one another. Begin to see life change happen as we build relationships. And we've got men's groups and women's groups and stuff on Bible studies and just and some of them that are just fun and just all kinds of stuff. And we want you to be a part. And some of you, God's calling to lead a group. Some of you, God's calling to lead. And that's happening right now. i got to look at this paper to tell me. You text the word um, home crew. There we go. Is it one word? I don't see it. Anyways. Oh, visit LegacyWaco.com slash home dash crew. There we go. <laughs> right there. If you want to lead, y'all are on top of it. Thank you. If you want to lead a crew, some of you have called to lead a home crew. You don't have to be perfect. At Legacy, we say every member is a minister. There's no hierarchy here. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be perfect. All you have to do is be willing. Just say yes, and we'll help you. We'll train you. We'll help you through it. It's a short semester. It's only 13 weeks. We help you and lead a crew. And others say, well, I'm not ready to lead, but I want to be a part of one. And those are launching in just a few short weeks. We'll, we'll be keeping you updated. But I'm telling you, get involved. I've said this before. And I'm going to say it more often because I just, I know this is from the Lord. Give us one year. Give us a year. A year? Did he just say a year? I did. Just give us a year. Give us one year of your life. Go all in. Go all in. Do all of it. Join. Go through Legacy Link. Join the church. Start giving. Get involved in a home crew. Serve. And watch what God does in your life. I promise you, your life will change.
I promise you. And if it doesn't, I'll help you find another church. I'm not playing. I will. I promise you, your life will change because it's, it just works because it's the plan of God. How many of you can attest that your life will change? How many of you have done it and know that your life will change? I promise you that it will. Listen, we love you. We are here for you. I know this is a strange time, but we're moving forward. And we've got a word in our house and in this house. The word is that we're not just maintaining, but we're advancing. This is not a season to make it. This is a season to expand. This is a season to invest. It's not a season to just hold on, but it's a season to invest spiritually. And if it's a word for this house, it's a word for your house. Somebody say amen. So, Father, I speak expansion over every area of our lives, Lord. I speak expansion over our homes, over our businesses, over our finances, over our families. Lord, I pray that every obstacle that stands in the way would be torn down and removed. Father, we bind up every spirit but the Holy Spirit. We pray for expansion in every area as a church for Legacy Church, we pray for expansion of our reach, Lord, of our influence, expansion in children's and in youth and, and online presence and, and right here in this building, expansion in finances, expansion in, in the way that we can minister to our community and to our city, Father, and over every household that's represented here today and, and that's watching us online. I speak expansion over your house in Jesus' name name. Greater peace, greater joy, greater provision, greater purpose, greater anointing than ever before in the name of Jesus. I thank you for joy unspeakable and full of glory. Let it be in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. Family, we love you. We're praying for you. We are here for you. If you need anything, send us a direct message. Text that word CONNECT to our number, 254-218-3100. We want to connect with you. God bless you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful week, and we'll see you right back here next Sunday morning at 1030. God bless you guys. What an amazing time of worship and word today. We're so grateful for our pastors, and we hope that you enjoy service. If you made the decision to follow Christ today, we are so happy for you and we love you. It's the best decision that you'll ever make. Uh, commitment lasts longer in community and to get plugged in, text CONNECT to 254-218-3100. For a next step class, Legacy Link, visit LegacyWaco.com slash Legacy dash Link. We are so grateful for our generous church and there are two ways to give. Text GIVE to 254-218-3100 or visit LegacyWaco.com slash GIVE. To keep up to date with us, follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Legacy Waco or text LEGACY to 254-218-3100. We love you. We're always praying for you. Have a great week and we'll see you next week.